Friday later would be fine. Yeah, we could go 11 to 12.30. We could meet and have a lunch. Afterwards. Yeah, I'm going to be in my studio. Yeah, we can go over to Park and Tavern, sit outside. Oh, thank you. Bring Steve. Do you guys want, this is the St. Kate Sustainability yes. Action Plan? Absolutely. I mean, Robert will be with me. I don't know if Steve will be there or not. Okay, well, he doesn't have to. Do you guys like a copy of the St. Pete Okay. Sustainability yeah. Action Plan. Yeah. Sure. Paper, that I would helpful. love that. There you go. Thank you. Thanks. You are welcome. Oh, that's welcome. Good. That's nice. Yes, please. No. Oh. Thanks, I could do something. Yeah. It's six, so I want to feel like I'm going to keep going. Mm hmm. I'm looking through here to see how many people I have. On um, where? You signed up? I wonder if they can just hook Paul's what? computer up See, and then with a cord. In the same keep thing. Could we just hook Paul's computer to the cord and then he can project? I have to have it in. Uh, no, I have to have it like in a USB. Yeah, that would be fun. We can just walk over to. Because afterwards, I always like to do that. Yeah, a bunch of different yeah. files that happen with that. Yeah, I just so, so, actually, like when to run? It's from 11 to 12.30. 11 to 12.30. So why don't I just meet you at your place at 1 o'clock? How about why don't we meet at Tarp and Tap? Yes. Yeah, because so I have to collect everything, and then we, Robert and I walk over. Post it now. So I'm going to go ahead and get the meeting called to order. Do you want this copy of the St. Pete? I need to write myself a note. I have a patient in response. Hey, I see. Question for you. Um, oh, so much. Okay. Can you read the call? Yeah. <laughs> 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 it does yeah. make it a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome, uh, guests. It's so exciting to see some people out in the audience. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to call to order this um, meeting of the Sustainability Committee of the City of Tarpon Springs this Thursday, May 20th, 2021, 6 p.m. Can we get a roll call, please? Nope. Sorry. <laughs> okay. One second, guys. All right. Chairperson D Dory Larson. Present. Vice Chairperson Call Robinson. Present. Member Taylor Mandaloo. Present. Member Denise Menino. Present. Member Karen Gallagher. Uh, Member Robin Sanger. Here. Member Carol Mickett. Present. All right, thank you. So our first uh, item on the agenda tonight is a follow-up um, presentation from the Girl Scout Troop 1142 meeting that I attended on April 23rd, 2021. So I went over to um, the Catholic Church and got to sit in on Girl Scout Troop meeting and hear what they are working on and um, they are working towards, and I don't want to steal all of their thunder, but um, <laughs> give a little bit of background. Um, so we had been invited to participate and the committee um, ad had asked that I go represent our committee, so I did. And um, they are working on an eco-advocacy badge where they are to identify a problem um, work with local officials um, to, to generate research about the problem, identify a solution, and then present that solution. So we have them here this evening to do just that. So I will go ahead and um, any questions about, about that? All right, then I'm going to hand it over to them for item number two, which is the project presentation by Girl Scout Troop 1142. Take it away, ladies. Hello, we are Girl Scout Troop 1142 from the local Tarpon Springs community presenting our Take Action Project to help better the community. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
So the issue at hand is a lack of visual education to the public on the issue of water pollution in our local environment. A great example of this on a global level would be the Pacific Garbage Patch, which is about 7.7 .7 million square miles of trash. And we don't want any of our local communities to become trash-filled wastelands. We want them to remain as beautiful as they currently are and even better. Next slide, please. On a local level, um, global warming, along with potentially clogged sewer drains, leads to flooding of local roads, which hampers access to local schools and businesses. This makes local commute a struggle during her Florida's hurricanes and rainy seasons. Tarpon Springs, particularly the sponge dock's history and economy, is based on fishing, sponging, and tourism of wildlife and natural beauty. Water pollution would negatively affect wildlife and negatively affect the local economy. Next slide, please. So the solution to the problem would be to start a storm drain project similar to the ones that are sponsored in the city of Clearwater and in Pinellas County. This project is at aimed to educate the citizens and visitors of Tarpon Springs to the dangers associated with allowing trash and other pollutants to travel down storm drains and into our open ocean and bayou. This ongoing program would be held by a city group, ideally the Tarpon Springs Sustainability Committee, as the project aligns with the objectives found in resolution 2019 to 15. This project also aligns with the Pinellas County Code prohibiting pollutants from entering surface waters, the drainage system or roads leading to storm drains. Next slide, please. So this storm drain education pro project also aligns with the Pinellas County Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan for Clearwater, Harbor and St. Joseph Sound. So it says continued watershed management to maintain appropriate water quality to support seagrass. Next slide, please. So these are examples of storm drains that were done throughout the community. So these paintings ideally would reflect the specific area that they are in as well. So for example, a drain by the dog park across from the sponge docks could have specific aspects such as dogs or a drain by the bayou could have aspects of marine life that are found in the bayou and the waters. Mm -hmm. So this is actually our Girl Scout troop. So we got this idea because we participated in Clearwater's um, storm drain program. So that's actually a storm drain that our troop painted down in Clearwater. And then there's a picture of us um, with a different drain that we painted. Next slide, please. So we use the steps from the Clearwater program to come up with a basic um, overview of what um, Tarpon's program could look like. So step one would be select one or more several city-owned storm drains to paint. Step two would be create a design that incorporates an environmentally conscious, ocean-friendly theme. Step three would be once a draft of your design is complete, submit it through the storm drain mural application process. And step four would be engineering department will inspect your selected storm drains and remove any existing storm drain play cards from your selected sites. Step six would be install your art piece and you can see the pamphlet in front of you which has further details in front of that. Can you switch to the next slide please? Step seven would be that ensuring all the brushes are cleaned and step eight would be sending photos to, of your completed design to Tarpon. Um, and then step nine would be continue um, being an excellent steward of your storm drain by keeping track of a basic maintenance. Um, next slide, please. So this educational project would obviously be promoting, you know, it's only rain down the drain. So the ways we could keep uh, raising awareness for this would be a lot of uh, media coverage so posting the photos of the newly painted storm drains to try and raise awareness, along with educating the community regarding the importance of only rain down the drain. So we would be able to get some local schools involved with the different art clubs and different service clubs. We could also get local businesses to try and sponsor these different drains. And we could utilize the city's website under the projects tabs to help create advocacy. Next slide, please. 
So to, in order to uh, create these murals, we would use volunteers. So volunteers could be pulled from the different interact clubs or the rotary clubs, which are all about community service, which works really well with this project. We could get businesses or other scout groups to offer to do them as well. Businesses could essentially sponsor them by helping provide money in addition to the money we would be getting from the city. And they could uh, help fund different ones, especially in front of their own storefronts with matching color themes while also raising awareness about the issue. Volunteers would be provided with all the materials. They would only be volunteering to paint said murals. Next slide, please. Scout group found a couple of potential locations, so one of which was near the dog park and the uh, water splash park, because there's a lot of good foot traffic there. And a lot of times people don't realize that they have to pick up after their dog's waste, because that can end up going down the drains and the uh, different uh, chemicals within the uh, waste often pollutes the water and can cause like different algae blooms and things of that nature. There were two very large ones off of Pine Street and Gross Avenue, which is close to City Hall and the local elementary school, which would be ideal because of all the foot traffic to help raise more awareness. Next slide, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So just before I read out all the costs, remember that this is a rough estimate and then many of these materials can be reused multiple times before having to renew them. So. Necessary materials would be safety vests for painters, cones to control traffic, paint and paint brushes, outdoor paint sealant, wire bristle brush for cleaning your surface, sidewalk chalk for outlining the designs, a tarp to protect the, the ground you are not painting from the paint, paint stirring sticks, paint mixing containers, paint rollers and trays, a bucket, paint can openers, and painter's tape which is about $151 for the start. And then, as I said before, you can reuse multiple of these items before having to renew them. And some of them, like safety vests, as long as they're kept in good condition, can be reused many, many times. And if you wanna see the prices of each kind of material, there's a rough estimate of each right there. Hmm. Next slide, please. Um, where will the money to fund this project come from? We were thinking that local businesses could sponsor drains and help to cover costs. Not only would this give these businesses a chance to put themselves into the community, but it would also put a good image out showing how much they care for the environment. Tarpon Springs City Council or different local government groups could add a budget line for this continual program. Apply for a stormwater education grant from the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Next slide, please. So this problem can be how this problem is addressed. So due to the nature of the project, the community would be not only reminded for caring of both their water systems and pollution consistently, but this project would also serve to attract tourism from the beautification of the city's drains educate our youth and other generations on the importance of water conservation in our community, and it would align with county stormwater education initiatives, lowering pollution levels. Next slide, please. So this is our, um, these are some of our resources here, and I believe the PowerPoint was also emailed to several of you guys. So if you would like more information, these are where we got some of our resources and information from. And there's also links to Clearwater's, the city of Clearwater's, their storm drain mural program as well. Next slide, please. And that is it. Thank you so much for having us here today. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you, ladies. That was well-researched and informative. Um, so I guess I'd like to open it up to our committee for questions about uh, if we have questions about the presentation. Um, have you spoken to the Public Art Committee at Tarpon? It seems to me that this is something that would be under their preview. So um, 
the the public art committee i believe the city project manager was thinking that we could get the art community involved as well but we really the goal of this project was to be sustainable and that it helps and advocates for pollution control and going down our storm drains which is where we thought the sustainability committee might come into but we would love to get the art committee involved as well the the public art committee from the city really makes the um, recommendations about what art is in the public realm in Tarpon. So um, I would think that it would be prudent to address that committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you, wonderful presentation. It was very well thought out and I, I would support you in any way I could to see this happen. I love even on our, some of our trucks, it says only rain down the drain <laughs> that you see when the trucks go by. And it's just such a good reminder and this would reinforce that more. Mm -hmm. I really like the locations that y'all mentioned, the one by the elementary school and the one by the dog park. There's a lot of foot traffic there. And um, as far as funding, I know Rotary puts out grants mm -hmm. quite a bit and that might be a, an ap a, an, a avenue to get funding. And Paul Smith, does the sustainability committee have any way that they could help support this or should this be something that would go as, as Carol mentioned to the public art committee or how do you see this working? Thank you, Paul Smith, public services director <laughs> and the sustainability committee really doesn't have a funding source dedicated to it but I do think the public art committee does have programs where they provide funding so I think that suggestion is excellent by Dr. Mickett and um, it's something that Ashley's been working with the Girl Scout troop to start to coordinate so I really uh, think both committees have um, some input and we can go from there. Excellent and that would that be something that we could say that the sustainability committee endorses this project and provide a letter of support mm -hmm. that would be up to the chair and and the members but um, I think that would be within your ballpark for sure yeah then I, I would recommend that we support this as, as we can to to promote it and further it I don't have any questions uh, other than those but appreciate y'all coming here your thought and your effort and your leadership skills and um, that's it great Uh, very nicely organized and, and well presented. Thank you very much for that. Quite professional. Um, I agree with Dr. Mickett. The Public Art Committee really needs to sign off on the location of artwork in, in the city. But I think my, my thinking is that the Sustainability Committee could certainly support this. Thank you very much. I thought it was a wonderful presentation and I'm certain that it's completely aligned with where our hearts are and where our work is headed. And I'm sure that we're all going to be 100% when it comes to endorsing the concept of doing this around the city. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really like the idea. I think it's a great way to kind of raise awareness city beautification as well and mm -hmm. I don't know it's just uh, like if somebody's walking by they see it and it's just like oh yeah all the water does go right back into the ocean so maybe I won't toss this litter mm -hmm. but uh, yeah I think it's a really it's cost effective it's it's a great idea I'm all I'm on board all right well good job ladies thanks again for your leadership and your presentation outstanding citizenship um, my, I, I agree with everything that's being said. Um, I think that you know folks would want the public art committee to weigh in to um, give recommendations and also maybe work on the funding aspect of it if it's going to be housed within a, a city committee. I don't know if they have a budget public art committee. I believe that they might. So I think it may be more appropriate to do that. Um, I, I think it would be kind of cool for our two committees to actually have a project like this that we're both kind of giving input in because mm -hmm. it really is environmental activism and mm -hmm. art, you know, you know, and beautification and, and telling a story through art. So um, I, I think that that's really good to have both. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more of the, like, for the ongoing education. So if somebody sees the artwork, then maybe there's like a plastic placard or something that has a QR code where they can scan and be educated more about stormwater pollution. Um, so that's kind of where I think that our committee might have a little bit more 
or have some input because I, you know, with, with the bang the table, if we're going to have um, places on the website where we can have information by subject area, then either either that or maybe even we don't link to our work, but you know, the, one of the other there's the Tampa Bay Estuary Committee or, or Estuary Program or the some of the other committees that were named. If they've got educational resources, then maybe it links to them, you know what I mean? And, and people can learn more about why it's an important issue. Um, so that would be my only um, other thought. But so I heard that we would like to, and it sounds pretty unanimous, um, maybe write a letter of support. I, I would, um, I can see any of what was up there. I'd like to see the, the proposal um, before, well, I don't know if, I guess I don't really have a vote. Mm -hmm. I don't know, is it this? It has a lot of the things in it, the steps and all that. And then some And the, I see. I didn't see this. And to know what materials are used. I mean, that may be something that the um, Public Art Committee could delve into um, traffic paint. Hmm. Traffic paint might work. Um, oh, I didn't see this. Thank you for this. So it sounds like there is support from the majority of the group to um, write a letter of support or uh, endorsement, endorsement of, of the idea to send over to the Public Art Committee to present to the, and then Ashley, I think you, you've got the dates and you, you're coordinating for, the, for proposal? the next Public Art Committee meeting. So the next Public Art Committee meeting, I'll look that up in just a second here, but the proposal itself would be due seven days prior to um, the meeting and that would go to um, Diane Wood. Um, and of course I'll continue to follow up with Andrea if that's the way they'd like to go. Mm -hmm. All right, does that sound good to everyone? Mm -hmm. Any other comments from staff, things that we might want to think about? Paul Smith, I just wanted to say as a staff member, I've been um, working with scout troops over the years, almost 20 years. That's, I think, the best presentation I've ever seen, and um, you right. should be very proud of yourselves. Very well done, a lot of work, and uh, makes it easier to act on when you're organized and have specific examples, so great mm -hmm. job. All right, then I think I think we've got our direction. Thank you, ladies. Uh -huh. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, so our next item is natural systems. We're gonna have a presentation by Dr. Robinson to talk to us about air quality. Yep, okay. Ashley, I'm in your hands. Can't hear you, kiddo. Do you want to start with the original ones or with the new ones? Uh, start with the original ones. Mm. So what is, is it okay if we move so we can actually see it? Wrong with that? Pardon me? I said I don't have a problem with that. If you want to like, come over and sit up there. And sit I up like here. them on the screen. To where yeah, I just remember if you're going to make comments, you got to come back to the microphone, or a microphone at least. I never make comments. Oh, I get them okay. on this screen so that I can <laughs> scroll through. <laughs> you're in Siberia. <laughs> Do you want to start kind of going through it without the visuals, or do you want to wait? Um, I'll do my best. This is going to be a little disjointed, but um, we have talked about whether to include NS4, which is air quality, mm -hmm. in the main body of our plan. And 
I was concerned, uh, both as a scientist and as a physician, that we were not considering doing that. So I did some digging, uh, called some people in the business, and came up with some information that stunned me. We tend to think of air pollution today as a problem that occurs mostly in cities. That, in fact, is not true. Um, air pollution has multiple sources, and it occurs in agricultural, rural, urban, suburban areas. And there are multiple um, sources of air pollution. If, well, I don't think those are going to help us, so I'm going to just wing it, OK? We have assumed, because we're in a rural or semi-rural area, and we've got the Gulf of Mexico blowing nice breezes across us, that we have good air. Historically, that has not been true at Tarpon Springs. Uh, in fact, from the mid-1940s until the mid-1980s, we had bad air. The majority of the bad air was from sulfur dioxide, and there were three main sources. One was the Stauffer chemical plant, which is right across the Anklote River. Mm -hmm. Another was the Anklote power plant, which was a coal burning plant until 2012 when it began a transition to natural gas. And the other was manufacturing, various kinds, cement, etc. You would think that when the Stauffer chemical plant stopped processing in the 1980s that our air would get better. But one of the slides I was going to show you, and I, I plan to send all of this material to the committee after tonight to just back up what I'm saying, is that if you looked from 1999 to 2009, in fact, during that entire 11-year period, the air quality in Tarpon Springs was consistently worse than the average for the whole state of Florida. And for several of those years, it was worse than the average for the United States of America. Mm. Why? Stauffer Chemical shut down. Okay, it's a Superfund site covered with dirt. It may be leaching arsenic and cadmium and other poisons into the river, but how could it affect the air? Well, the Anklo Paro plant continued to burn coal until 2012 when it, when it transitioned to natural gas plus oil. But it's still there. When Lucienne and I bought our home, we had to sign off, this was in 2006, we had to sign off on the fact that we knew that the Anklo power plant was right across the river from where we live in writing, or they wouldn't have allowed us to close on our house. I'm not making that up. That's true. We're that close to, to the river. We're right on the river, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and the other thing is that at that same time, people who lived in the neighborhood near the Anklo power plant were, were being given vouchers for free car washes because of all the soot and black carbon that came out of that plant and landed on their cars and their houses. I was going to show you the map of the Anklo power plant and its location and the neighborhood next to the Anklo power plant. I drove out that way and looked around. Mm -hmm. It's a poor neighborhood. That's probably not going to surprise anybody. These things tend to be placed in poor neighborhoods. It's, but I mean, the fact that it's a poor neighborhood and you know, it's, the houses are small or they're trailers, they're up on blocks, there's a lot of chain link, there's a lot of you know, beware of dog and no trespassing and dead end and um, other, other signs like, and there's an elementary school there, it's Gulfside Elementary, it's within four tenths of a mile of the plant. And I have never been to an elementary school in my life in which I saw four signs that said, no smoking, no drugs, and no guns in this building. And as I left that area, I had a sore throat. And the sore throat lasted the rest of the day. I'm, I, that's probably psychosomatic, but it's true. It really happened. OK, industrial is one cause. When I send you the material for this, I'm going to show you another map of Florida that looks at ozone. Pinellas County doesn't have a high ozone level relative to the other counties in the state. But Hillsborough is the worst in the state. Pasco and what's right below us, um, doesn't matter. We're buffeted on three sides 
by the worst and the two second worst counties in the state of Florida for ozone. Another cause of air pollution is traffic. The, the two worst counties in the state of Florida in terms of the percentage of their population that's within 500 feet of a major highway are Broward and Miami-Dade. Pinellas is number two, worst. In terms, we have 15% of our population is within 500 feet of a major highway. Now, we don't have a public transport system. Cities and, 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 and locations that do can significantly lower their air pollution. Another thing that I looked at was pollen. Pollen in Tarpon Springs for this two week period beginning this last Monday is high. It's high only for grass pollen, but it's high. It's not very high, but it's high. It's not moderate, it's not low, it's not good, it's high. And it lasts every single day until next Wednesday when it becomes moderate. That's grass pollen. So I looked using a website, which Dory just pulled up, called Air Now. And Air Now is a product of the EPA plus some other agencies, including a, a, a state agency. Air Now monitors ozone, PM2s, and PM2.5s. Ozone is three molecules of oxygen linked together. It's a highly reactive chemical. It's, an, it's, a, it's a form of air pollution which is a gas. It's particularly irritating to the lung and to the nasal and, and oral airways. Um, it also monitors two particulates and particulates are little particles. PM10s and PM2.5s. PM10s are, are, PM10 stands for particulate matter 10 microns. PM2.5 stands for particulate matter 2.5 microns. To give you a feel for what that means, microns are little tiny things, they're microscopic. A human hair is 70 microns in diameter, so PM2.5s are one thirtieth the diameter of a human hair. As we, as the science moves forward, we are finding that PM 2.5s are the nastiest thing in our air in terms of their impact on the human body. And I was going to show you a good piece of lung tissue and a bad piece of lung tissue. The good piece showed nice pink tissue with nice big respiratory bronchioles and lots of air movement, and the bad tissue affected only by concentrations of PM2.5s had broken down the septi, the dividing walls between individual air sacs. The whole air sac area was inflamed and red. Here's the kicker. PM 2.5s don't just harm lungs and lung tissue. Because they're so small and because inflammatory tissue is not as effective at keeping stuff out of the body, PM 2.5s actually pass through the wall of the alveolus into the bloodstream, go to the heart, go to the brain, go to the kidneys, go to the uterus, go to the whole body. PM 2.5s are the real enemy today. And what we're learning is that our air, even when it's considered good, ain't good as far as 2.5s are concerned. I was going to show you a picture that showed the air quality index from Air Now, from the EPA and, and other agencies, that showed that our air is moderate this entire week. Not good, moderate based upon ozone, PM10s, and PM2.5s. Moderate means that the PM10s are above a certain level. PM2.5s can be above 12. Ozone can be above 50. There's evidence that shows that normal people, adults, 
who breathe air that's PM 2.5s below what the EPA considers normal actually demonstrate dementia. Hmm. At levels of 10.7 below 12 on a Weschler intelligence scale, normal functioning adults look like they have early dementia. So the AP, EPA is going to have to lower the safe level. And okay, I, I think I've said enough about that. Another thing that affects our air is wildfires. Anybody know the significance of the period of time between October 2016 and June 2017? in this context. Mm -hmm. The relevance is this. During October, from October of 2016 to June of 2017, Florida suffered the worst drought in 103 years. Yeah. What does drought do to air? It increases dust, mm -hmm. it increases pollen, and it predisposes to wildfires. In fact, there were between, between January and June of 2017, there were more than 2,000 wildfires in Florida. Mm. Our air quality deteriorated. Mm -hmm. We became the wildfire capital of the United States, <coughs> take, took over from, from California for that period of time. So for all these reasons and more that I can't seem to pull up, I think we should include air quality in the main body of our plan. I think we should include one objective and two or three actions from um, NS4. Which one, I just pulled them up so that I could uh, look at it. Um, which of the community level outcomes, outcome one is concentration and emissions of criteria air pollutants um, achieve attainment or maintenance status for all measured criteria pollutants, and then B is demonstrate a decrease in the annual concentration of non-attainment criteria pollutants, um, and it specifically mentions PM 2.5, PM 10, and ozone. Um, and then outcome two is risk from hazardous air pollutants. Option A is demonstrate the community's total cancer risk is less than 50 per million, or B is demonstrate a reduction in the total cancer risk from hazardous air pollutants in the community over time. Which one are you recommending? I would either rewrite option A or adopt option B because it specifically mem mentions PM 2.5, 10, and ozone. I would, if it was my, my choice, I would rewrite option A to say achieve consistently good status for seven major criteria air pollutants, carbon monoxide, ozone, nitrogen, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, PM10s, and PM2.5s. Option B, I would consider that a close second choice. Although I don't know what non-attainment criteria really means. So I, my choice would be to rewrite option A. Okay, so let me just make sure I've got this, because Ashley, I think you would be the one, uh, let me make sure that I'm taking good notes and you're taking good notes and we can try to compare. Um, so you're wanting it to read? Achieve consistently good status for seven major criteria air pollutants. CO. Hang on just a second. Okay. Achieve consistent good, and what do you mean by good status? Well, I would use whatever the EPA is using at the moment. I would use the good status of ozone less than 50, and is it, no, it's 55. Ozone less than 55, excuse me. Um, PM 2.5s less than, uh, of 12 or, or below. And PM 10s, I don't remember what the criteria is. I was going to look it up. Okay. Okay. So uh, good level, good the, status the for the seven for all of those, major yes. criteria pollutants. Is that what? Yep. Oh. 
C O. Okay. O three. Mm hmm. N O. Mm hmm. N O two. Mm hmm. S O two. Mm hmm. P M ten. P M two point five. All right, and then what local actions? Let me preface this by telling you about another slide I didn't show you, which just popped into my head because I looked at action number one. If you look at seven categories of sources of air pollution, and then you look at African American, American, African American, African Americans, other people of color, and whites. Consistently, African Americans and people of color have higher concentrations of pollution from right. all of those seven categories than American whites. So I would include action one, conduct a study to evaluate the geographic areas and subpopulations with the highest exposure to outdoor air pollutants, particularly in consideration of environmental justice and equity impacts. Okay. And then that's, that's your, so that's your recommendation for the local action? And then I would include action four educate the public about the impacts of poor air quality. Hmm. Okay. I debated action two. I could go either way with collaborate with local industrial operations. I suspect that they have lots of regulations that they have to abide by. But I think those two actions would, would be a good step. Thoughts from the committee? I have a question. <clears throat> so, uh, great information. Thank mm -hmm. you for bringing this forward. Appreciate it. Can you hear me better now? Yes. <clears throat> no, no, no. So, um, in the local action one, I understand perfectly what you're saying. And generally, that's true more in large municipalities and urban areas where. Uh, black communities are historically in areas of, of industrial or that type of thing. I'm wondering how much in your consideration, how much do you think that applies here in Tarpon, as, as small of a, a community as we are? Do you think that would be a measurable difference between one part of town and another here, especially considering what you mentioned about in, uh, with you and your wife living on the river, but where you were situated, so it was a more affluent area, but you were probably getting more stuff than other people, you know, being where you were situated. So mm -hmm. how do you think that plays out in Tarpon? Just your thoughts. One of the fascinating things about the measuring um, of air pollution that goes on is that of the measuring stations that the state of Florida has all over the state, the one that's closest to the power plant in Holiday across the river only measures ozone. They don't measure any particulates. They don't measure sulfur dioxide, which was the major problem in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, actually. Hmm. They only measure ozone. Now, that's an indirect measurement of nitrogen oxide and, uh, and dioxide, but, it, but it's not a measure of sulfur dioxide, they, and it's not a measure of any particulates. So. That neighborhood where you've got a high school right here and you've got an elementary school right here, and lo and behold, Cemetery Road is the closest one right. to the power plant. I'm not making that up. Nobody's looking at PM 2.5s or PM 10s or sulfur dioxide. <laughs> if we move that concept to Tarpon, how do we measure the various neighborhoods? Well, it turns out that there's a website called Purple Air. Purple hair or Pur air? Purple Air, A-I-R. And there are monitoring devices that you can buy for 200 bucks that are handheld that you can integrate with that website. You can learn how to use the device and you can publish your findings on that website. Mm. So for 200 bucks, 
theoretically, I haven't done this, okay? I have a buddy on the other coast who's done it, but that's the only way I learned about it. Um, theoretically, we could buy a device or two and do our own study mm -hmm. or suggest to the city that it do its own study in various parts of the city and get more really specific local information than we can get any place that I've been able to find. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Do you know if there's any if there's any increased in part particulates when there's construction going on? You know, like uh, grading sand and that type of thing. Does that go into the air? I've, I have no idea how that would contribute. But if we're in a in a period of significant development, mm -hmm. and you see the trees are going away and the sand is getting, you know, I mean, how does that contribute? Do you, I mean, I'm not not putting you on the spot, but just if you happen to know. Well, of course, it depends on what they're breaking up and what right. they're grinding. But, I mean, the general answer is probably yes. And it could also be interesting to see what it is at, at the uh, landfill, at the old landfill, to see what is actually coming out of that. I know that there's probably some, some uh, mm -hmm. stuff coming out. They have the vents and so forth. Yeah, I think that this, if we recommend this, this leads to all kind of possibilities. It's interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Good questions. So, um, if we actually know, um, you know, if you know what causes the particulate matter 2.5, and you're going to educate the public, like let's say we adopt the option four that's in there, um, how is there any hope of reducing um, PM 2.5? I mean, to just tell people, yeah, we're breathing this, it's outside of our control unless we have um, a public transit that really works or, you know, I mean, viable options. I mean, how, how will it affect people that don't know anything but here we've got this danger or a potential danger? I mean, you, you said when we were looking at air now that the, um, that, that was a misleading um, statistic if it showed that the air quality was good and we actually had um, some of the uh, particulate matter 2.5 in the atmosphere at all? That's a lot of different just, questions, but let me, let me yes. start where I think the beginning was. Paul, can you speak into the microphone yeah. so that yeah. people yeah. at home are yeah. hearing what you're saying? Um, yeah. <sighs> One of the sources of particulates and gases and volatile organic compounds is burning wood and burning leaves. Um, and that affects not only indoor air pollution but also outdoor air pollution. Mm -hmm. If we educate people to the fact that they are harming the, potentially harming the health, uh, and, and this is the way I would do it, PM 2.5s, if they are sufficient concentration, cause 20% of the strokes that occur. They cause 26% of the heart attacks that occur. Mm. They cause 40% of the pneumonias. They cause 20% of the kidney dysfunctions. They cause 20% of the, the cases of um, miscarriage, low birth weight babies, prematurity, they also cause, in children, autism, cognitive deficit, A2P, that's, that's the general rubric of allergic diseases, asthma, of course. If we tell people all of that and then say, don't burn wood in your house, don't burn leaves outside your house, and these are other things you can avoid, yeah, it could have an effect. So I want to get us moving on to our next agenda item because we're at almost 7 o'clock and we haven't started even talking about climate and energy from last time or <laughs> health and safety, which is what we're talking about tonight. And this could go on for hours because it's really, it's really interesting. It really impacts people's health, health and their lives and their well-being. And 
I'm really glad that you researched it further and brought this to us. I will just say briefly that transportation causes a huge number of these criteria pollutants and electric cars don't have tailpipes, so they're not putting this at the street level into our communities. So that's one thing that people can do, mm -hmm. and that's something that's in, um, as an action item in uh, climate energy as a solution um, that we've selected. So I, I wouldn't mind putting option A the way that it's, that you've suggested into the plan and maybe even have it as like a long-term goal of like not something immediate to do a, um, you know, because it's, it's another one of those create a plan, or, you know, which, or conduct a study. It's a high price item and we've got several of them already in, in the plan, but I think that it's important. I think that it needs to be looked at and examined. So, um, so I would like to go ahead and include option one and then, um, or outcome one, out, outcome one, like you've recommended. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we do include conduct the study that it would be with the understanding that it would be kind of a stretch goal for, you know what I mean? Like not a near term, like some of the other, like, uh, doing the tree, um, study or some of the other studies that we already have identified and then looping in the educate the public we've already got that so it could just be combined into part of what we're doing with educate the public for natural systems educate the public about air pollution yeah because we've already got to educate the public about water quality that's what the girl scouts were here about you know we've got to educate about other environmental and natural systems issues so so you're suggesting just include in what's already written educate the public about air quality and air pollution? Yeah. And how do we come to the question of equity and the impact on equity in this, in our city? Isn't that later? Did we, are we not doing the uh, equity piece? Yeah, I'm saying, that? I'm saying keep, keep local action one in there, which okay. addresses the equity, but just with the understanding that it may not happen next year, that, you know, cause this plan is gonna be like a three to five year horizon, so. I have a question. Um, if, if burning wood and burning leaves um, creates a lot of these particulates, does the city have restrictions on people um, burning leaves and wood? Because I know that in my neighborhood, people do it. Um, and they burn their leaves, they burn all sorts of stuff um, in their yards. Paul, can you weigh in on that for us? I can, and I have to say I'm doing this off the top of my head, but this is one of the points I wanted to make is this is a county function, this air um, mm. quality enforcement type stuff, and um, they have county ordinances. In fact, I think there is something in there about burning in Pinellas County, mm. um, and I can look that up and get back to the committee on that. Um, I would also say that if we're looking into doing a staff function of monitoring air quality, I really would rather see that be done by the agency that's charged with doing it um, so that, you know, taxpayers aren't paying for the same services twice. Mm -hmm. um, I would like us to use our energy to uh, work with Pinellas County and collaborate with them on their monitoring program and, you know, lobby them to purchase this monitoring equipment if they don't have it and put sites, we're in the county and no reason why they shouldn't just like they have the mosquito control and some of the other things and should be serving our city as well as the rest of the county so mm -hmm. I would put that out there to think about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that how do we um, engage the county in in doing this and do we put that in the plan or how can we put that in action yes you'll see in there several of these um, local actions will include wording like collaborate with, mm -hmm. and um, that's how that could be worded. Um, for example, the, um, the action one that you all talk about could easily be a collaborate with, as could outcome one, because there's already an existing um, air quality monitoring section at the county. The problem that I see there is that uh, you would assume that that was already being done, but I can't find any evidence of it at all. And we are reporting not to the county. Our charge is to report to the Board of Commissioners what we recommend. Um, if you look at Whitcomb Bayou, just to use a different example, what the mayor said after my presentation and, and, and Karen's presentation last month 
was we've gotten nowhere with the county in terms of dealing with Whitcomb Bayou. We've tried and tried and tried and gotten nowhere. I don't want to leave this up to one government agency of one size having to communicate with another government agency of a larger size to try to get this done. I think if we recommend it, we recommend it for the city of Turpin Springs. Mm -hmm. Thoughts about, I mean, I personally would like to see like not a duplication and I agree that if they're not doing it, then maybe we put it in the plan as a recommendation to like seek that out and, and facilitate that collaboration. I have a question, Paul. You mentioned that there was a, um, a site that meant that monitored uh, ozone but nothing else. Yes. Who monitors that? Where does that come from? I believe it's the state of Florida. Um, Because it seems like they're, with those devices, someone's monitoring something. Now, if, if it's only ozone and it should be more than that, you know, hopefully they record, they record information and it goes somewhere. Here. Here it is. Pasco County. Well, that's Pasco County. So that so Pasco County monitors. That's the I don't know that it's under Pasco County. Um, Would it be possible to ask you to follow up with your presentation and see indeed if there is something at the county level or at the state level that is being done, and we could come back to that come back to this at our next meeting because I also appreciate that there's you know more understanding to be had from. I this. believe this is under the state. Um, Department of Environmental Protection rather than under Pasco County. And it happens to be in Pasco County. Right. I don't believe it's under the county. Would that be something that you would consider doing? I mean, you know, I, want to ta I don't want to task you with something, but consider for doing further research and see exactly what's being monitored and where it goes? I'll see what I can find out. That'd be, I think that would be helpful. But this is the closest monitoring site for the state of Florida that I have been able to find mm -hmm. to that power plant. And I believe it is a state of Florida monitoring site, not a county monitoring site. The, re the, re the interrelationship I, between the state and the county, I have no idea. I'll see what I can find out. But okay. I, you know, at this point, I don't know. Or see if there's a possibility of having more monitoring sites here in our city. Just to, you know. I have to say that, that this um, was a compelling report and frightening report um, the things that um, I always say about art, it makes the invisible visible. And this report made the invisible visible. And um, I, it, it's given the consequences that you detailed, health consequences of these particulates, especially PM 2.5. Um, it does seem to me something that we do need to address and um, the more we can find out about it, the better, because I think a lot of us do assume that our air quality is good. I certainly did. And now I'm gonna wear a mask a lot. <laughs> it can't be a bad idea. Okay, so then what we're gonna do is, I mean, is either way, I think that option one, adding in the, the goal no matter who does the monitoring of it, I think we want to add that into the plan. So I think we should just go ahead and do that, unless anybody's got a real issue with outcome, that. Outcome one. Right, outcome one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I should be using the same terms. And then definitely local action for educating the public. And then we'll put a pin in conducting the study, just the wording of it of like who's conducting the study. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good to everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right, um, next on the agenda then is Paul Smith is gonna give us an overview of what he has so far for the natural systems section. Um, when we put this in, given that this report has been done, can we include that as an appendix? Because it would help 
I think, for people to see, here, here's a reason why we want this done. Um, is that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're putting a, lots I mean, of why, different studies in the appendix, so why not? All this great stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're ready for 3B. Um, a few meetings back, um, Dory suggested, I think it was a great idea, that we show the committee a little sample of what the report might start to look like, because sometimes it might feel like we're really in the weeds and not getting anywhere forward. So we're trying to balance that action with study. And um, so what you have here is just that. This is a sample of what one of the sections might look like, and I have to say, uh, when I was working to put it together, it started to click for me, and it really affirmed why we're going with an established framework and using some really good local examples. And what I'm talking about is the St. Petersburg ISAP. Um, I really started to see that when the table started coming together. So I'm, what I'm going to do in the essence of time is just really talk about the format for you. I'm not going to go through those individual lines. I invite you to do that and give uh, any input to Ashley and I if you want to do it that way and then um, or you can bring some thoughts back to the next meeting but whatever we can do to help us keep moving forward my goal would be this first one basically each of these goal areas that we work through this is natural systems showing you how this would translate into a report I think once we get the first one going the, the rest of them can start moving more quickly so it's sort of a systematic way to do it so what you generally have, and you'll see this looks very similar to the St. Petersburg example, but you know, certainly not copied from there. Um, but I think why reinvent the wheel if it's a working format? So you have a under five, I'm, I'm looking at what's on the screen here. The very first part is a simple introduction of that particular focus area, natural systems in this case, this goal area. A short paragraph about why it's important. Then the next section is called Targets and Objectives, and this is really the outcomes that we all have worked together on turned into bullet points. So all that work that you all are doing and turning in your priorities and then we work through them, this would translate right into almost cut and paste right into the report. So I want you to know that your work is really going towards writing this report. The next section, Priority Actions for Natural Systems, those are the local actions. So they're shown here as bullets. Generally, we highlight the key words in these different uh, local actions. But then really, I think where the magic is, is the table. And it's pretty small. I'm going to put the readers on for this one. This doesn't happen very often yet. <laughs> you know, more it to happens come. every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what you have here, if I can walk through the columns with you. So the first column, this is something I added. You won't find that in the St. Pete example, but it's showing you which objectives we pulled from when we all work together to combine them, so it'll help you cross-reference. Um, but when we combine things, for example, um, we talked about including planning, and we had several of them that we wanted to group together. The goal was to try to get the rows of these, of these tables down to a manageable level. So uh, you have each of those working your way down. The next column is what type of action it is. You know, is this planning analysis? Is it policy, infrastructure? And that has an effect on the next few columns, which is how much does it cost? There's a legend at the bottom. These are order of magnitude estimates. And then the time frame. You know, a short time frame would be zero to three years, medium four to six. And there really isn't, I don't think, anything longer shown than that. Um, the, the, this is where it really starts the rubber hits the road, right? This is, okay, which, who's going to work on this? Mm -hmm. So you have like a lead city department, and then next to that you have the partners who would, you know, outside of the city be working on this. And then the final column is the picture symbols of what the co-benefit areas are. So I put draft on this because I haven't talked to each of these departments or the city manager yet about 
how all this is going to work. This is just me putting my best first guess on how this might Tell look. Tell what those symbols mean. Yeah, those are right out of the framework. But yes, we can put a legend to um, define that. But yeah, it, there's actually wording on the top of those, but even these readers, I can't read it. Yeah. If yeah, you we're look trying in the, to fit I'm sorry, it on eight interrupt. In the paper copy that I gave you of the St. Pete ISAP, mm -hmm. if you look on page 36 and 37, it's natural systems. It's what they chose for their objectives and their um, local actions. And then it has the legend down at the bottom. So we could do something like that. So uh, it's page 36 and 37. Natural systems, healthy and safe, but right. economy and jobs. Yeah, they do have words on them. It's just you have to blow it up a lot. <laughs> yes, the challenge of the eight and a half by 11 table. Right. If you look at the wording that St. Pete has, and then you look at the wording that we have, their wording is easier to understand than ours. I think we will make our material easier for people to comprehend if we deconstruct some of these long sentences. For example, under targets and objectives, the second arrow is redundant. Demonstrate that 85% of the population lives within a one-third mile distance you don't need the word distance. We all know mile is a distance. Within one third of a mile from green infrastructure, you don't need features, just green infrastructure. Features is an unnecessary modifier that provides localized cooling through tree canopy. You don't need cover, just tree canopy. Or vegetation, you don't need surfaces, just vegetation. And then the entire rest of that sentence simply is redundant of what preceded it. And you can go step by step through this and remove modifiers and qualifying phrases, shortening each one. When you get to priority actions for natural systems, which I would simply call actions for natural systems, the first six actions all have to do with green infrastructure. We could make it simpler. We could, we could wordsmith this by just using the rubric green infrastructure and then list six bullets underneath it like green infrastructure colon G or you know parenthetically GI. GI shall be included in natural systems planning. GI shall be considered in site reviews of developments under consideration. A percentage of funding shall be dedicated to GI, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got, instead of these long sentences that all use the same word, put the word at the top as a rubric and then list short phrases underneath them. I'm all for making it shorter. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add too that um, these are copy and paste and we'll definitely go through an edit editing process, but thank you, those are helpful comments. Mm -hmm. We kind of cut you off. Is there more that you wanted to say about the the no, that's that really, I probably said plenty for everybody here on this item. I'm excited about it. I think that it's visually starting, you know, we're starting to see what, what we're doing. And thank you, Paul, because I know that this took a lot of time to mm -hmm. get it all organized and chart the way that it is. Yeah, I just was pleased to see how our work together um, really did make it come together much easier than if I had to sit down and type all this up, you know, out of my head. Definitely. All right, if we don't have any other questions or comments about that, then I think that we'll just anticipate that as we continue going through this, then Paul will continue to build out uh, what we're doing like with climate and energy and then um, if we can get through health and safety this evening. 
Yes, and I'll look for ways to economize, um, as Dr. Robinson suggested on the next ones. Mm -hmm. Okie doke. I'll be happy to help any way I can. Thank you. Okay, so the next item is climate and energy. And I don't know how to really go through this visually without a screen to be able to project um, other than, yeah, they were actually sent them out, so we everybody should have. I just I just combined what we had, or you know, I what we prioritized is what I have listed for the um, each of the um, <clears throat> areas. So the you know the outcomes and then the local actions, and. As you can see on the bottom of it, the yellow is where we combined all of the educate and um, outreach. And then the orange is the enforcement and incentives because there were quite a few of those. So, uh, I mean, you know, I, we had wanted me to kind of tighten it up based on our comments. So we're, does anyone have any issue with the way that this has come together? I'm lost. We We're are on climate and energy. I know that. So um, when Ashley sent out the agenda, it was one of the attachments that uh, the attachment is called item, item four, four star, star preferences CE. Mm -hmm. And it is a spreadsheet that has the preferences. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Mm -hmm that has each of the climate and energy um, oh. outcomes and local actions. The only thing that I noticed that when I combine them all and we, you know, I'm looking at it, is um, for greenhouse gas mitigation, we only had one local action and that's to implement um, a climate action plan intended to transition the community toward the use of alternative modes of transportation and low emission vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't include anything about um, low emission vehicles in the outcome six, which is the um, local government actions. So I'm wondering if because that, you know, we had talked about trying to include in the plan things that the city could control and actually impact and do. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would like to see that action about um, transitioning the modes of transportation to low emission vehicles included in the city. There was one, there was a local action um, in CE6, Local Greenhouse Gas and Resource Efficiency. Um, it wasn't high enough ranked that we all selected that, mm -hmm. but um, I just wanted to throw that out there as to see if you guys would consider that local, adopting that local option or local action. So under CE6? Right. Say again, please, Dory, what you said. Ashley, can you pull up the, um, the one that looks like this? Might be easier just to read it. <laughs> The manual. The manual. Which action is it, Dory? It is. Sorry, I'm scrolling and it's, there's a lot of them. Action four, the um, local government sustained, well, that's the plan we're working on. 
Well, it's actually, I think, it's just not worded very strongly. Um, action six is adopt alternative fuel guidelines or targets for hmm. local for locally owned facilities and vehicles. So I was thinking that would be a good place to put like a green fleet plan. So instead of, yeah, it's really hard to read, but it's, poli it's uh, action number six, adopt alternative fuel guidelines and or targets for locally owned facilities and vehicles. So we're looking at the city's fleet of vehicles and trying to create a green fleet adoption plan instead of, or I mean, or we could keep the other in as well, um, but you know, trying to whittle it down, <laughs> being conscious of like maybe trading one for the other. But in local action two, it's greenhouse gas mitigation, and it talks about um, transitioning the community towards the use of alternative modes of transportation and low emission vehicles. So it's just that the audience is more like the city doing the action versus the community. Um, so I wanted to get people's thoughts on that. Dory? Is the city already do it going in that direction? I mean, is there something that you, you're just looking to have it codified as a, as a local action on the city's part? I don't, I don't know that we have a green fleet plan already in place. I mean, I know that there's like anti-idling policies, but I don't know that there's like a preference for low or no emission vehicles mm -hmm. already in the purchasing guidelines. So I would like to see it added in. I definitely think that would be appropriate to include it in this section. So in not take the community one out, leave, leave that local action eight programs and services in under greenhouse gas mitigation, but add in creating <coughs> or adopting local action six under CE6. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, is everybody, everybody's okay with, with that? Okay. Sure. Okay. And then those, that, I mean, that was the only thing that I saw that kind of jumped out when we put it all together. And I was like, oh, we're missing that. And I really want to see that in there. Um, but everything else, it just got kind of squished and combined. Like I said, combining all the education and outreach and combining the enforcement and incentives so that we have fewer local actions so we don't have like 72 local actions was the idea. Okay, so I'm, I'm ready to move on then to the next item. Okay, all right, so item number five is a discussion on health and safety preferences. And again, we don't have a way to visually go through this as easily, uh, but Ashley's gonna help us out. And thank you, Ashley, for compiling all of this. Thanks to everybody for getting your preferences in for health and safety. Um, so she put them in the chart. Does everybody have in front of them? I, we all got a copy on our desk as well. Okay. Um, so again, looking at um, the highest number of votes, there weren't any of the outcomes that had a majority or four, at least four votes besides um, HS six hazard mitigation um, outcome number two. Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. So along the top um, are the outcomes and then the second are the local actions. So of all of the outcomes, the only one that had four votes was HS six hazard mitigation. So we would only have one um, outcome for this section, which might be good to kind of balance out some of the other sections where we have quite a few <laughs> outcomes. Okay, then let's go through. I'm listed uh, as not supporting HS1. That in fact is incorrect. Um, I did not support HS7, but I did support all the rest. I don't know if that, all, if that changes anything. HS7, 
Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> I, I'm listed here as not no support for HS1 and HS7, if I'm reading this chart correctly. The, the chart actually includes everyone's submissions that I handed out. Where are you? Okay, I'm looking. This was not the right page. This is the one that we did initially just to figure out which order we were going in. So we are looking at. Um, I didn't get. This. Is it on your? On we're your, looking at this document. Just got this hand up. You have you it, got it. Okay. All right. And Sorry. It was, that's okay. Ashley emailed it to Where are we? <laughs> okay. Let's try this again. <laughs> so. It's more. So the like. top are the outcomes for each of the uh, HS categories. There's seven. The only one that received four votes oh, was HS6, hazard mitigation outcome number two. And then Dory, real quick, if I may, just as I've done with all the others, if there was any question next to them and possibly even a maybe, I did not include those. So if you do end up wanting to go back and change any of that, please let me know and then I'll go ahead and include. Thank you, Ashley. So I think that we should go through and just go through HS1 and look at the local actions that were selected as a priority by most of us and just kind of go through it together like we have with with the others. So Ashley's going to help us scroll through so that we can read it and all be seeing the same thing. So for HS1, which is talking about active living, um, so she has it pulled up on the screen, or if you have it in front of you on your computer, I'm gonna pull mine up as well. Um, it starts on page 100, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, HS1 is on 102. 101. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so HS1 is about active living, and the, um, like I said, we didn't have an outcome that, that the majority of us wanted to take action on. For local actions, local action two received four votes, also six and nine. So action two is um, requiring or incentivizing bicycle and pedestrian amenities in new development projects in high density in mixed use areas or near transit stations. So we're gonna include that one. Mm -hmm. And then six is achieve recognition as a bicycle friendly community or a walk friendly community or achieve an average community walk or bike score of 70 or above. And then nine is implement a local enhancement program that systematically improves at least three bicycle and pedestrian amenities community-wide. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So was there any other of the local actions that you were really gung-ho on and did not get selected? Dory? Yes. I have a question. So we we're, we already have multimodal transportation in our city, right? So we're walkable, bikeable. That's already in place. Is that a question? No, it's a fact. Okay. So how does that fit into this action? If it, if there's something already in place, how do we? We're we're a multimodal transportation city. I think we're the only one in Pinellas County, which is why we have the shared lanes and all that for bike walking cars and all that so i don't want to double up if there's something that we're we're already doing but maybe highlight that we are doing that and that that's we're that's a very innovative thing when that was when that was put into place is that correct paul or am i i understand your point um i would say you could look at this as a checklist as well so if we list an item even though we're doing well with it it's just a way to remind us to keep an eye on something and look to improve it as a priority in the future. Good. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. So I think action nine kind of stands um, as um, a goal to continually improve the safety of what we already have in place so that we can encourage more people to get out on their bikes as an alternative an enhancement program, what would that be? I really appreciate it after I moved here, for instance, I had written or communicated to someone about how dangerous it felt crossing um, 
at Safford, you know, to get across the road, mm -hmm. to get across Tarpon Avenue. Mm -hmm. And they assured me that there was something in place. I mean, there's going to be places like that where anybody that's walking or riding their bike might feel um, that it could be improved. And I think maybe that's what the goal should be, is to constantly improve the safety features of the various bike trails that we have as an option in this area. Because we are rich in, in bicycle trails and walking trails. So it'd be nice to just make them um, a lot safer. I have to say that, you know, we have the Pinellas Trail, which is a county um, entity. Um, but where I live, getting to the trail is com very dangerous. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have to go out on and go over this little bridge that's like frightening and then bike along Spring Bayou, which is like really scary, and then go on Orange, which is like <laughs> the whole way. Um, so I don't like riding my bicycle to the trail. And if I go the other way, um, I ride on sidewalks, which in Florida you're allowed to do, because the roads are just too frightening to, to ride on. Mm. Um, and we now keep our bicycles in our studio, which is right next to the trail. But so that means I can only use it when I'm working, which is, so I don't think, I mean, I can see there's, you know, some um, places in this tarpon that work, but um, there's a lot of places that are really, really difficult. And if I lived down on Riverside, I'd be, you know, wouldn't want to ride my bicycle. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's all the more reason to keep action number nine in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a city, mm -hmm. yeah. continue to system systematically look at where we can realistically enhance bike paths and pedestrian paths. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we want to have three, at, at least three bicycle paths or just leave that open in terms of numbers? On number nine. Pedestrian amenities. Maybe three is like a short term goal, maybe. Yeah, and then I think we could that, add yeah. more just to like keep it moving. Can there be incentives like when they put in um, new roads or in, that they widen it to put, I mean, widening is hard because you have to take people's property, you know, but in some way um, put bike lanes. I know it's controversial, and St. Peter's was very controversial when they started putting in bike lanes everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think that with policy action number two, require and incentivize amenities and new major development projects, I mean, yeah. to me, that, you know, when we're building a new road or we're widening a road or whatever, that that would, that that would be captured it. there, that, that we should be always focused on mm -hmm. not just roads, but, I mean, not just car travel, but bike and foot travel. Mm -hmm. I think that covers that. All right, so the next one, HS2, is community health. I just want to say one more thing, that in terms of bicycle-friendly community, um, St. Petersburg has that designation. They got it, um, received it a couple of years ago. For HS2 Community Health, we have one item that got four votes, and that is, so again, none of the um, outcomes, but local action four, which is prohibit smoking in all enclosed public spaces, including restaurants, bars, and workplaces, and affirm the right for landlords to legally establish smoke-free rental units or restrict smoking in multifamily buildings mm -hmm. community-wide. I'd like to see something about the beaches because it really irks me when people smoke on Sunset Beach and then they just stick their cigarette butts in the sand and walk away. But I don't know if we could do that or if we, if we could like create more opportunities for them to put them in an appropriate place. I don't know. I, I, and I think that the state already has mm -hmm. um, regulations on, on smoking, so I don't know that this... 
Yeah, you can. I mean, you cannot smoke in a public building or in a restaurant. Right. So, I mean, this obviously this framework is also is nationwide, so it, it may not, <laughs> it may have missed the memo that we've already outlawed that in Florida. Um, so I don't know, I mean, I don't see reason to, I don't know. I don't know if we need to keep action four in there. Um, so if we can't strengthen it to include the beaches, <laughs> then, <laughs> then I, I don't know. But I also don't see reason to, you know, why it couldn't just stay in, but. I mean, there's well, got to be something that captures the con the littering factor. You know, you cannot leave a cigarette butt in the sand. You're saying that that's what pe most people are doing, and I'm sure you've done be the beach cleanups where <laughs> they've been. It's a ton of cigarette butts. And it's horrible. It ends up in animals. They don't break down. It ends yeah. up in birds. And I think How about e-cigarettes? Um, do they have the same prohibition in terms of you can't use them in any place except outside or in Yeah, that home. was the vaping law that, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well then I guess we'll just leave this one alone and go on to e Oh, I did have uh, oh, something to go add. Go ahead, Taylor, sorry. My only criticism on that one is the bar crowd might not be too happy. Um, there are smoking bars that like, you know, there's a lot of smokers and they like to smoke in their smoking bars, but then there are some bars that don't allow smoking, so maybe that freedom, but that's, that's really the only concern I had with that particular one. That's a good point. I, I, I'm back to the, it's a state law, and I don't know that we are able to supersede state law anyway, right. so I kind of feel like this one's a moot point. That's consistent with what I remember when I checked into that about Sunset Beach concerts, that we really couldn't prohibit it, the smoking. So I think you're right. So do we want to just scratch this one from being in there then? I mean, if, if there's no point in having a policy that we can't enforce. Mm. I, I was in favor of Action 10 simply because vector-borne diseases are increasing in this country, but I don't know what develop and implement a comprehensive program focused on vector board diseases exactly means. So I don't feel that strongly about it. I'm fine with this as, as it is. Well, I was specifically talking still about number four, the smoking. I, I know. Oh, okay. I thought you were moving on from that. Oh, though. okay. <laughs> well, I didn't, get a, I didn't get a yes or a no. I was kind oh, of okay. waiting to hear a yes or a no. Do we want to keep it in or take it out? Is there, is there a, what, I, the issue with landlords to legally establish smoke-free rental units, they can't do that already, or no? I have no idea about that one. I think we need to do some research on what, yeah. the, what the current law is and whether it's coming from the state level on yeah. that. Um, if, if there isn't anything that defines how rentals are treated, I think that we need to, we, we could probably yeah. have something in there and we, but I would agree we, we need to there's no point to being redundant here if um, it's something that's already being addressed at the state level but we could t be a little bit um, more defined if areas are left yeah. out okay and it is it is a, a the rental and all that is re a real concern a friend of mine just had to leave actually Tarpon Springs and moved to Pasadena because the unit that she was rented in an affordable uh, housing uh, apartment, a smoker had been there previously and they couldn't get rid of the smell, so she had to move and there were no other units available, so she ended up in Pasadena. Now, you know, that she said that I talked to someone at that same uh, complex and they said that they think management is changing it now because obviously it harms their ability to rent units. Sure but it was really sad to lose her, you know? Mm. Anyway. Okay, so we've got an action item of researching that for, for item number four. And Dr. Robinson, your comment about 10, um, sorry, policy, action item 10, there was only three people that, no, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. There were, yeah, three people 10. that supported that. So, are, and you're okay with leaving it out based yeah. on okay yeah. i i was one of the people that put voted for that and 
I'm, I'm reading a book called Spillover now, which is about how animals trans, um, diseases are moved from animals to humans, mm -hmm. and it's becoming larger and larger, and it's creating these big pandemics, like maybe COVID-19 could have been involved with that as well, a, a Zoom, zoonosis or something. Zoonotic. Zoonotic. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is more and more important. And of course, the way in which they often move from the host animal to the human is through a mosquito. And so I would think that this would be, and these are things like Zika is through mosquitoes. So it, it, the mosquito, you know, takes blood from an animal and transports it. I think that this is more and going to be more and more an issue, and I think it would be good to include this as something that um, before it gets too late. So we start now um, looking at this because what's happening because of climate change is a lot of the animals because are moving uh, north. From, um, from places south of us like the equator, and they are bringing up other diseases that can be um, infect human beings and create pandemics. So I think we should be cautious and forward thinking, and I'm glad that you have um, remarked that you support it 10. So I'm lobbying for it. Mm -hmm. but, well, I have a question, and maybe Carol, you can help help me understand this. Develop and implement a comprehensive program focused on vector. I don't know what I don't know what that is. I mean, what is a comprehensive program focused on? Does that mean like a public education program, or is it? I think it's a health department type program, and mm -hmm. once again, it's a county, county. type function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we talk about these things, I'm trying to think several steps ahead on how would we how would staff we this, yes. enforce it. You know, and I, I want to be realistic about we could write down something to do, but then there's the part about getting that actually accomplished that may not be feasible within our locality. So uh, it's sort of a balancing act between you want to get it done and lobby the county to, you know, continue to monitor it and 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 put pressure on the county to do more if we are not satisfied with what they're doing might be still the most feasible way to get there besides trying to take something like that on ourselves. But one of the things that the local people can do is they can, for example, with mosquitoes, we know the sorts of things and we're told all the time, you know, don't have standing water, et cetera, et cetera. And if the city had, you know, even if the county takes care of it, unless they know that there are issues, um, they can't do anything about it. So the city can um, have, I, I don't know, you know, how it's done, but there can be a way of monitoring more carefully where there are problem areas that, and then bring the county or whomever in to treat them. And as these, you know, certain animals like iguanas are becoming, you know, this is just an example, are moving up from the south. And what do we do if the city can notice them and contact, maybe that's already done, but um, I think that this is a, going to become a bigger and bigger issue from everything I've been looking at. When you're, when you're looking at Action number 10 from the perspective of Zika and chikungunya, and I would add dengue and yellow fever, et cetera. Um, you're talking about a genus of mosquito, Lyme disease, mm -hmm. different organism. Right. Um, but those three, you're talking about IDs genus mosquitoes. Perhaps encouraging the development of an education program for our citizens is the way to approach this. Mm -hmm. 
probably a lot of people don't realize that Aedes aegypticus lives in our houses with us. Mm -hmm. And that they get into our houses because they, they position themselves at doorways. Who does? And wait until we open the doors the and mosquitoes. then they come in. And they are, they live with us. They, the Aedes uh, albopictus does not, but aegypticus lives in our houses with us and that's when they bite us. And they are the major carrier of, of these diseases. So maybe an education program is the way to approach this. Not just for these, mm -hmm. but for other diseases as well. But maybe also there can be a way of um, letting people know what are safe ways to um, get rid of them, other than swatting them, you know, and what are, and I think that's a major issue that all of us have. How do we get rid of the mosquitoes? Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to use spray. We don't want to put that stuff on our body. Um, so what are the best ways to safely um, get rid of, of mosquitoes and provide education for all of us in, in Tarpon? Um, that would be a really, I mean, I would love it to have that. There's definitely an opportunity when new development is done because we were just reading, just reading an article this week on how um, Disney World is completely mosquito free because of the way that they designed everything there hmm. to not have pooling water. <laughs> and that's a pretty amazing feat, you know, for a, an amusement park that size. But there's an article on the internet about how they made that area completely mosquito free through designing buildings that had um, runoff, 100% hmm. runoff. And there's no standing water anywhere. Hmm. So when I'm thinking, I was trying to look through and see if there's any of these actions that are like educate or doing something like that. Hmm. And really the only thing that, that works is uh, action three is adopt a health and all policy statement um, or policy commitment for local decision making. So kind of like to your point, Denise, about when we're designing new public buildings or you know that, that that's a consideration. And then it wouldn't necessarily just be about mosquitoes, it would also be about heat and some of the other health concerns that we have. Mm -hmm. So maybe, looking at policy action three, adopting a health and all policy statement. Ashley has it pulled up if you guys want to take a look at it. So action three is adopt a health and all policy statement. I don't really know what that means. Yeah, what, what, would, that, what would that be like? Or how do you see that? What, what type of a... Hmm. What type of a statement, a policy commitment? Maybe we could talk through it and see what. Why don't I put a pin in that and, and do some research okay. and then we can come back to it? Because I know like St. Pete has a person, a staff person, and it's a health and all policies person. <laughs> and so I could ask what specifically that looks like. Sounds good. I'm gonna bet that it's gonna be a resolution from the Board of Commissioners that says basically that, that in our Decision making will include um, reviewing, you know, how it affects health, you know, in all of our decisions. I think that that could be a good thing to have in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if I guess looking for direction, then do we want to just include it, or do we want to get some information and report back? I can. Either way. Include number three. Is that what you're saying? Or Correct. Yeah. Well, as as long as it specifically mentions these um, these potential diseases that are growing. I think we need some specifics in there, not just this big blanket statement. Um, I think, I mean, uh, this is really the wave of the future. <laughs> yeah, I it's agree. It's not present. Uh, the three is, is much more vague. Yeah and general than 10. 10 is specific. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we could do three and then add on, for example. Blah, blah. And okay, so let's put a pin in that. I'll get some research and get back to everybody. Is that? Yes, and so, Dory. Yeah. It, it, for Action 10, to see what the county's doing, what, what type of programs they have in place, or would that be something mm -hmm. that we could, we could get support from our county health department from or something like that? Okay, so that's another to do. And specific those things that, that y'all mentioned, because that's a that's a really good point. Things are getting warmer. All right. Um, so moving on to HS three emergency management and response actions two, three, four, and five. Dory, yes. Excuse me. What did we do with action ten? I mean action nine. Is that something that is going? What did? No. It only received three votes. Okay. Because I would like to, to uh, advocate for something with Action 9 that was a concern for me, and that is the prevalence of mold in houses here, mm. especially low-income housing. And I know people in all types of you know, income brackets who have mold issues in their house, and that's a big health issue. Mm -hmm. And something, something to where if, a, if an apartment or something is to be rented, that it's checked for mold, because like uh, Paul Robinson mentioned, that's people get very, very sick from mold. Yeah, Especially if it's, let's say it's an elderly person living alone, they don't know that they have mold, but there are all kinds of symptoms that develop and it can become a chronic illness. So my concern with nine was specifically mold mm -hmm. as a health issue. Is, but, is there any way that um, action nine and 11 could be somehow interfaced? Um, because the 11 also talks about remediating indoor mm -hmm. air pollution problems in low-income homes. So mm -hmm. that's a primary one that I would think, in the, especially in this area, that there would be some enforcement of testing that's done or that pl uh, complaints are answered without retaliation, you know, for people that have mold issues. Because I hear, I hear about this every day. Mm. And I would agree. Um, Dr. Robinson, do you see that there's any, does it, this um, touch upon any of the air quality things that we were talking about before? Was that just outdoor air quality? It wasn't indoor air quality? I didn't hear everything you asked me, but I, I was focused on outdoor air quality. And that's, uh, yeah, so this is an indoor air this quality This is indoor air quality issue. and mold air? is a real issue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Indoor air, will that be considered indoor air pollution, do you think? Yes. And especially in low income homes or affordable rental units? Mm -hmm. I or think even it would accessory be nice units. to see nine and, nine and 11 combined because I think that that's one, I mean, now that we're talking about it, maybe it would get more support because mm -hmm. we're able to discuss our thoughts on it. I think it's something we should, we should include as far as for health and safety for our residents. First. So I'm hearing that we want to add nine and 11 and combine them. Combine them. Does everybody support that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Doesn't Tarpon have a housing authority that actually inspects things? Or is that again a county? I don't know that they go into residence units and inspect them on a regular basis or anything. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the nature of mold other than it's a, it's can be a real health issue, but I don't know how often they come in and inspect or if they inspect or I have no idea, but. Hmm. Well, it is the case that um, at least in commercial buildings, the fire department goes in at least yearly to make sure your fire <laughs> extinguisher, at least in St. Pete, because they used to come into our commercial building every year to make sure that we had a fire extinguisher and well we had several of them and that they were up to date and they checked out everything so and if we had a new tenant they would definitely come in so 
maybe for commercial they do that and maybe for residential but an apartment building's commercial so you would think that they would have to do that i don't know Okay, um, trying to make sure I'm taking notes and capturing all of this. <laughs> um, so let's move on to HS3 emergency management and response. Items two and three got five votes. So action item two is education and outreach, publish information to encourage residents to develop emergency kits and evacuation plans and encourage businesses to develop emergency procedures and shelter in place plans. And action three also received five, and that's participate in cross department agency, interstate, statewide, regional, or interjurisdictional mutual aid response systems. And we may already do that. So I don't know if that's something that we, but again, we could keep it in and just may have it as a check, yes, we do. And then four, action four and five also got four votes. So action four is to participate in regional emergency planning commission. Mm -hmm. And action five is adopt a local comprehensive plan for emergency response that includes provisions for evacuating low income, disabled, and other persons likely to need assistance. So we'll keep all four of those in. Don't we all, I mean, we get mailed to us every year a packet telling us about evacuation plans and, I mean, and what to put in a kit and all of that. So I'm, I guess I'm asking, is this in place already? It may be. I thought something changed recently with during emergency domestic. Tarpon does not have a shelter in the city limits anymore because it used to be mm -hmm. middle school, middle school yeah, and right. now it's it's going to be an island if there was <laughs> an emergency so it's not feasible to use it anymore. It's in Palm Harbor now but it seems to me that that could be a good action plan to, to have a evacuation center here in Tarpon. People feel if they're going to go to evacuation center, which people don't want to do, but it's more comfortable to think I'm going in my town than I have to go in another town. So if the city could find a place uh, to have an evacuation center, I think that would be a good action uh, plan maybe we can ask but I mean I know that that was a very contentious issue and I'm fairly certain that the fire chief was trying to <laughs> maintain a site in town mm -hmm. and it's not the city's decision mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I, I don't it's <coughs> the county decision correct oh, I see excuse me Doria to 753 okay so um, do we want to try and finish this tonight or do we want to carry this over to the next meeting? I move we carry it to the next meeting. <clears throat> I would agree. Thank you. So you'll second that? Yes. Okay. Everyone in favor? Um, aye. aye. Okay. These discussions are very helpful, I think. I mean, you find out way more than just by reading these. Because <laughs> you never know what they mean, I have to say, until people raise issues. And I think that when we start asking the community about <laughs> these, <laughs> we're going to hear more things that we didn't consider. And, <laughs> and that's good, too. Um, OK, so let's move on then to the items for the uh, next month's agenda. Obviously, we're going to want to follow up with um, the outdoor air quality one more time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll start with health and safety four. Finish 
Health and, and safety. And then also, um, so with climate energy, we actually completed. We're, mm -hmm. And I don't think there was anything that we were going to go back to and do research on. I, at least I didn't capture that in my notes. Correct? Woo! <laughs> All right, and then, and then we will pick up with health and safety preferences. Um, I think that we should have a brief report about what happens next Tuesday when you present at the yeah. Board of Commissioners. Okay, so a report back. And if we're going to go, should we appear at 6 o'clock? I don't know that the agenda has been published. Usually the presentations are at the beginning, but public comment's been going for an hour. So uh, I don't know. The meetings what, start, though, at 6.30. So we should be there at yes, 6.30. 630. Okay. So, Dory, is it helpful for us all to be there with you? or is it? Yeah. Yeah. Why not? I wish I could be there, but I'm not going to be. There. And I, I apologize. Eleventh. Yeah, I apologize. That was my fault because I looked at my calendar and I, it was a work event that went into the night and I didn't. I was just looking at the daytime on my work calendar. I didn't think to look. So. I will look forward to hearing about it. Yeah. Okay. So it, so we'll still do a report back, right? I could do it on the eleventh, but this is a question mark for me. But I will try to be there. Okay. So, so I've added the report back onto next month's agenda anyway, so that folks that can't be there can get a report back. And then um, hopefully we can maybe even get through the next um, segment, which would be, oh shoot, hang on. And if we could be working on getting preferences to Ashley for the next one. Um, you know, this month, which is that's what I'm looking up. Sorry, give me just a second. Um, one, two, three, four. Economy and jobs. What is it? Economy and jobs. Okay. And we'll put that in an email uh, as well. An ambitious agenda. I know, I know. But if if we don't get through, we just keep rolling them over and pushing through. <coughs> And I really do hope to talk about waste and um, uh, moving tarpon to zero waste, but I am not prepared yet. So not for next future, month either. No, okay. no, I don't okay. think so. I'm doing doing some research on that right now. Well, thank you for doing that. Sorry. All right, so let's go to public comments. And there's nobody on Zoom, so moving on to staff comments. I do not have any comments. I have nothing. All right, committee comments. I did have one thing I want to bring up. Um, so I can, I, Ashley, I can just read the email, right? Yes, That's you can okay. read the email, okay. yep. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I know how I mentioned um, last time something about like the regulated plant index for Florida and protecting those species in our comprehensive plan. Um, so I, did a little bit of research on it and I wanted to share that real quick. And will I be able to send that after I bring it up here? I will go ahead and send it to everyone. Okay. Um, where is it? Sorry, one, one moment. Here we go. Dory, it is 7.58. Did you? Um, It'll be quick. Yeah, can, I, can we get a motion to extend the meeting for a couple minutes? <clears throat> or motion to extend the meeting. Second. second. All in favor, aye. 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 I'm okay. sorry, was that Paul who seconded? Who's yes, Dr. Robinson, yeah. All right, so here is a brief synopsis of what I mentioned. Uh, our LDC has a section on endangered species, but it protects mainly federally listed species and the ones on the FWC uh, list, but it doesn't really mention our at-risk plants and probably some other animals, but the uh, there's a list the Florida Administrative Code uh, 5B-40 um, It's the regulated plant index. It has a whole bunch of uh, like around five to six hundred species that are either endangered threatened or invasive or commercially exploited um, and essentially 
she's going to send this to you so you can kind of look up specifically um, what I'm talking about. But you, it protects the plants from being taken off of the landowner's land, but the landowner can kind of do whatever they want with it. So if they want to develop, they can just develop right over it. Um, and I kind of, you know, I kind of like that's that's kind of wrong. But uh, at the so I found something else that was in the Florida statutes, uh, 581.185, that it says this list cannot be used to regulate construction or land alteration activities on any property. Mm. So it seems like it's mainly to protect those plants from being moved off of somebody's property for like scientific purposes or selling them. Um, but I basically want to think of a way that we could and put something into maybe our endangered species section in our LDC to kind of like give them some actual protections. Um, maybe like a survey, because you have to do endangered species surveys. So maybe include like a locally threatened plant survey or something like that, where we have a, a list of a few things. Because um, we can't just pull that list for regulation purposes. But uh, yeah, I kind of just wanted to like bring that up and see if we can, because we're supposed to be like putting things into the LDC. so. That's my two cents. <laughs> I like that. Is um, do we want to? Because we were going to be periodically giving give input to the LDC process. Mm -hmm. So do we want to? Do you want to try to like firm that up into something that you want to see included? Maybe not like next month, but yeah, I kind of want to. I want to look into that further and see see if I can do something or we can do something about it. Okay, so similarly to Denise wanting to have a conversation in one of our meetings about waste reduction, mm -hmm. just let Paul or Ashley know when you're ready to put it on the next agenda, you know, like the next month's agenda. Okay. So we could do that. I have a comment. Um, I've been doing the science panels, as Dory knows, um, connected with our show Expanding Waters. And the last one I did, um, included a panelist named Laura Thompson, who, Thomas, Laura Thomas, who's the um, sustainability officer for Largo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, of course I told her I was from Tarpon Springs. And the whole point of my comment is she sang Paul Smith's, uh, you know, said how wonderful he was and <laughs> he he's is. on this big <laughs> committee with her and he's always so um, knowledgeable and, um, she just um, applauded him. So I think that um, I wanted to mention that. That's Thank great. Thank you, lots of mutual respect there. She has been a real um, helper to us as a city. In fact, mm -hmm. both Ashley and I went and visited her and um, with our green fleet ideas and that's just one of many examples, but thank you for that, that's great. Yeah, she's very impressive. She is. Thank you, that's always good to hear. And very, you are very much appreciated, Paul. <laughs> Robin, that did you have a comment that you- incentive for us to get a sustainability person in Tarpon. Mm -hmm. Robin, did you, you had your hand up, did you wanna say something? Yeah, um, a couple of things. I think our, our waste management contract is coming up again, is that correct, for the- so that would be a good time to see what they could do to help expand uh, recycling, maybe just recycling of cardboard from businesses. Mm -hmm. That would be a opportune time to, because they're, they're generally, whoever's applying for this generally seems to be eager to accommodate, you know, to get the contract. So that might be a low hanging, mm -hmm. I, keep, I don't like that term anymore, low hanging fruit. Anyway, <laughs> and then did I send to you guys that Waste No Food Tampa Bay? Did I send that to y'all? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because Denise mentioned the, the zero waste things. I thought that might tie in. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Is there a way, when is the waste management, I mean, like that's decided with the Board of Commissioners. Is it negotiated with staff ahead of time? Like, is there a way that we could give input or? Sorry, I was thinking about an action item. Could you say that again? <laughs> yes. Um, Robin mentioned the waste management contract. 
So is, is that negotiated with staff before it's brought to the BOC? Like, is there a way that we could advocate for more recycling as a committee or? Yes, I, I actually made note of that to okay. uh, follow up with Public Works who does that contract and procurement and see what, uh, what we can do. Awesome. Excellent. Any other? Can you um, let me know what you find out from Public Works? I'm just really curious, you know, the, the uh, not just cardboard, but I mean, bo so many bottles right. and uh, cans and things like that are just thrown in the trash. Yep, true. And that's true. really unacceptable in 2021. So hopefully you can have some input on that. I was thinking, well, a lot of the businesses have so much, so many boxes, so many, you know, so the cardboard, I've seen them just crushed, and if there's no cardboard recycling, they just get put out with the, into the dumpsters, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if it's something that could be incremental, if waste management, I have no idea, if they want to, you know, have bottles, cans, and cardboard, I know there's a lot of cardboard waste, but see what's possible, definitely, it's a good idea, Denise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm curious if there's a commercial component as well as residential component, part of the contract, like how that works, or, or if not, if there's, like some cities have um, recycling centers, where you, you know what I mean? I mean, I don't know where we'd, maybe over by the, we do have that, over by the, the yard waste? There's, yeah, and one by, I think on Gulf Road too, by the fire station over there. Yeah, there's one near the, but I have fire station because we take our, if we have a lot of cardboard, like when we first moved here, we would take it there mm -hmm. because um, the recycling people didn't wanna take all the cardboard. So hmm. we would just put it in our truck and take it there. Or you could take it to the main recycling place. Okay. But the fire station's free, you just bring it over. I think it's still having it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Any other committee comments? All right, then I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 So we adjourned at 8.07. Taylor, were you the second?